Coming up on this episode of Crime Family. And it's reported that there's actually an understanding between the locals and Love County that if you go against one of them, then bad things will happen to you kind of thing. So they're kind of like this crime family. Just think pitch black. You're in the middle of the woods. You have no idea where you are. And yeah, you don't, you can't get out. I don't know what to think. I'm very, like I said, I had Blair Witch vibes. I don't know. And it's reported that between the two of them, they called at least 30 people that night asking for help. You know you're fucking mad. You know you're fucking tired. Fucking Moxley Lake, a buck knife, Molly Miller. They shot him in the mouth. Right there, I can put my finger all the way through it. What is this? Like, why aren't they like- I'm scared. That's so creepy. It's so creepy. Hey everyone, welcome to Crime Family. I'm your co-host Katie, and like always, I have my brother and sister with me, AJ and Steph. And today's case was a listener suggestion, and so shout out to Rhonda S. on Facebook. So I started looking into this case, and there really isn't a lot out there, but it caught my attention just because it's such a mystery, and it really leaves you wondering what happened out in the woods that night. It leaves you with more mysteries than answers. So thanks for the suggestion, Rhonda. Had you heard of the case before Rhonda suggested it, or was it completely new to you too? Yeah, it was completely new to me when I dove in. So this story starts in Wilson, Oklahoma, and it travels down into Love County, Oklahoma, in the summer of 2013. So Wilson, Oklahoma is a small town. It has a population that is less than 2,000 people, and it has an area that's only approximately 15 square kilometers. And south of Wilson is Love County. And the whole county of Love County has a population just under 10,000. And it's only a few kilometers away from Wilson. And so a man named James Con Nip, who went by Con to people who knew him, he had family property in Love County, And that's where he lived, so he was pretty familiar with the area. And so Khan, growing up, was a bit of a wild child. He had grown up without very many rules or directions or consequences. And so he was able to kind of run free as a kid, do whatever he wanted, get into trouble without there being any punishments for his actions. And, you know, not having discipline or rules... For your kids can be harmful in the long run because kids can not only feel like they don't have any boundaries or guidelines to really follow as they grow up, they can feel that the rules don't really apply to them. And so when they do grow up and actually do need to be accountable, they haven't gained that skill or discipline or respect for authority. And so it seems like this was kind of Khan's mentality as he grew up and into adulthood. So he was 21 in July of 2013. And there's speculation that he was in the drug business in Love County. Khan was hanging out with two people in July of 2013, and their names were Molly Miller and Colt Haynes. So Molly and Colt's friends and family described them both as very happy. Colt was always laughing and had a smile on his face. Molly was 17 years old in the summer of 2013, And she just loved life, and she was a very compassionate, outspoken person. She wanted to become a nurse when she grew up. She was a very good athlete and enjoyed softball and basketball in high school. And she was also very close to her grandmother, but when her grandmother died, she quickly went into sort of a downward spiral. And that's when she started getting into drugs and was hanging 
around with the wrong crowd. So Colt, growing up, he had five older siblings, so he was the baby in his family, and he himself also had a newborn son in 2013. So in the summer of 2013, Colt was 21 years old, and his son was only nine months old at that time. Colt was also into drugs, and he started when he was in his teens, so there's some speculation that that's how he may have known Khan through the drug world. But there's not a lot out there about how they met or even how Molly and Colt met. But there's reason to believe that Molly and Con were good friends since they were kids. And Molly and Colt were friends but had only known each other for a very short time, like a week or so at this point. And it was also brought up in the Up and Vanished podcast that Con and Colt had some sort of feud going on. And some reports say that Khan was going out with the mother of Colt's newborn baby. And there's some reports that say Colt was going out with Khan's ex-girlfriend. So maybe both, or maybe one or the other, I'm not really sure. But anyway, there's that kind of like dynamic, that element to their relationship where there's, you know, going out with my ex kind of tension thing. So it's not really clear about why all of them would even have been together and hanging out that night. On the night of July 7th, 2013, Con, Molly Miller, and Colt Haynes were out driving around in Wilson, Oklahoma. Special Agent Justin Brown with the Oklahoma Bureau of Investigations tells Crime Watch Daily that Con had a history of spinning out his tires in front of the police and then speeding off away from them to get them to chase him. And so on this particular night, Con and Molly and Colt were in a gravel parking lot of a convenience store. And when Colt spins out his tires, it causes gravel to spin up and hit the cop's vehicle that's also parked in the convenience store parking lot. And this causes the police deputy to pull out and pursue Con and his two passengers. So the sheriff of Love County at the time, his name was Joe Russell, and he knows exactly who had prompted this police chase. He knows it was Con, and he tells the deputy to stop the chase. The pursuit doesn't last too long as the deputy does back off and Khan's vehicle is last seen driving down Long Hollow Road in Love County. And at the end of Long Hollow Road, the street stops, so it's a dead end and it's surrounded by and leads into a large wooded area. So the route that they probably would have taken that night or one of the likely routes was from Wilson straight down to Highway 76. They took a left on Oswalt Road and then a right onto Long Hollow Road. And that's only about 17 kilometers, and it's reported that Khan had gotten up to speeds of 120 miles an hour, which is close to 190 kilometers an hour. So it would not have taken him long at all to go from that convenience store in Wilson to Long Hollow Road in Love County. So like I said, the police did back off the chase pretty quickly, And soon after the police chase does subside, a 911 call comes in from Molly's phone at around 12.57 a.m. on July 8th. But all they hear on the other end is buttons being pushed and then it's quickly disconnected. So that call only lasts about five seconds. And the 911 dispatcher does call Molly's phone back, but there's no answer. And Molly also calls a bunch of people that she knows as well. Like every few minutes, a call goes out from Molly's phone to a friend or family member. She's asking for help, saying she needs a ride home. But it's, you know, pretty late at night, pretty early in the morning. So everyone she talks to says that they're unable to go pick her up. Colt is also making calls at the same time as well. And Colt's sister, Monique, describes to Crime Watch Daily one of those conversations. So... Colt wasn't talking to her, but she was told by someone else who actually did talk to Colt that Colt says he's lost in the woods, he's laying in a creek bed, he doesn't know where he is, he knows that they're lost off of Oswald's road, and that his ankle was broken and the bone was sticking out. A private investigator named Philip Klein, who was working with the Up and Vanish podcast, interviews some of the people that Colt talked to. And they say that Colt had climbed a tree to try and see if he could get his bearings, kind of figure out where he was. But he apparently fell out of the tree and that's how he broke his ankle. So him and Molly are out there 
in unfamiliar territory, lost out in the woods in the middle of the night. And so Up and Vanished reports that a group of people actually ends up at Khan's house that night. They're trying to find Colt and Molly because of all these phone calls they're getting. And when they get to Khan's house, Khan is actually there. He had made it home and this group have Colt on the phone at the time that they're talking to Khan at Khan's door. And they're asking Khan where they can find Colt. But Khan just says that Colt must be messing around with them because he is saying that he doesn't know anything about it. He doesn't know what they're even talking about because he's saying he wasn't with Colt that night. Also, some of Colt's friends that he is able to get a hold of actually go out to the area that Colt says he is, somewhere off Oswald's Road, to try and find Colt and Molly. And they run into a man who asks, you know, what they're doing on his property. They explain that their friend is out there, lost in the woods. And this guy is actually cool and he wants to cooperate. So he goes... And Colt is actually on the phone at this time still. And this man goes in his house and he gets a gun and he just shoots it into the air. And he says, if Colt can hear the gunshot, then they know that he's not too far away. But Colt can't hear the gunshot. So they know that they're in the wrong spot. And they're driving up and down the road, honking their horn, trying to see if Colt can hear them. So they know that they're at least a little bit close. That's really smart, actually, of that person to shoot the gun and say, if he can hear it, he's close. Like, I think that's really, that's a smart way to kind of get your bearings. Yeah, that's really loud, right? And it'd be louder than your voice yelling. So it was a, it is a good idea. Is it reported that Molly is with Colt? Do they know that for a fact that they're together, lost together? Yeah, so at this point, it's speculated that they are together. But he has never mentioned her in the phone call at all yet? Like, he doesn't say he's with her, right? It's not super clear about all their conversations, but from what we know, they were together. And he might have been saying that, yeah, me and my friend Molly are lost out in the woods. Because like I said before, they had only known each other for about a week, so his friends probably wouldn't know who Molly was. Anyway, not that that matters, but I don't think he was like, oh, I'm by myself, come get me. He was probably just like, I'm lost in the woods. He probably mentioned Molly as well, but we're not really sure. But no one ever talked to her on the phone or heard her on the phone, so they don't know. Some reports do say that when Molly's on the phone, they can hear Colt in the background on his phone talking to people at the same time. So they do know that they were together for at least some of it. I'm getting um, I'm getting Blair Witch vibes right now. Uh, I know. Just think pitch black. You're in the middle of the woods. You have no idea where you are. And yeah, you don't. You can't get out. And it's not clear whether the police knew that Khan had people in the car with him that night. But some reports say that the deputy chasing him did not know that Molly and Colt were in the car as well. But the police do know that these three were all together that night, despite Khan denying that they were. And they know this due to the cell phone records and info pinging off the nearby cell towers that they later uncover as they're looking into what happened that night. So, like we were just talking about before, Colt and Molly's phones were pinging together that night, so there is reason to believe that they were together. But some also seem to think that Molly and Colt did get separated at some point, and they maybe each got lost separately, frantically calling everyone they know. And somehow they got separated and couldn't get back to each other, or maybe they did. But like I said, there's a lot of mystery. We don't actually know what went down in those woods, whether they were together the whole time, whether they got separated and then found each other again. Like, that's just not known. So the last call that Molly makes is actually at 9.39 a.m., on the morning of the 8th. So they've been out in the woods for like nine hours at this point. They still haven't been able to find their way out. And both Colt and Molly's phones are dead around 10 a.m. that morning. So no one's able to get a hold of them, call them. They don't call anybody else after that point. And it's reported that between the two of them, they called at least 30 people that night asking for help. So after private investigator Philip Klein and his team interviewed some of the people that Molly and Colt called, they put together a theory of what they think may have happened that night. Up and Vanished reports that they believe that Molly and Colt got away from Khan that night. So like I said, they were all in that car together. I mean, we don't know, but they either jumped out of the car or he stopped to let them out. But either way, he kept going and... I guess he just kind of left them abandoned in the woods on their own for whatever reason without a car. And like I said, they're unfamiliar with the area. 
And they're thinking because they felt like the cops maybe were still following them, they may have been hiding from the police initially. And so it's reported that they were hiding in a ravine, as Colt had told someone on the phone. And so the vehicle that they were in that night was a Honda Accord, and they were driving through some pretty rough terrain. It's believed that they drove through a creek bed, and the undercarriage of the car was pretty messed up when they did find it. So they were like driving through the woods in this car. And meanwhile, after Molly and Colt get out of the car, Khan is still driving for a little bit. He breaks through a couple of barbed wire fences with his car before the car finally gives out and dies. And it's also reported that the locals are kind of used to this kind of thing. Like they're always repairing their fences because Khan is driving his car through them all the time. So this is just something that he did. And his family home wasn't too far away from where all this goes down. So because Khan is familiar with the area, he just leaves his broken down car out in the middle of the woods or out in the field, wherever it was. And he's able to just run home that night, leaving Molly and Colt out in the woods. So those cell phone pings that I mentioned earlier, they put Molly and Colt just adjacent to the Colt family property and only about 100 yards or 300 feet away from where Khan left his busted car. But like I said, they were unfamiliar with the area, so they had no idea how to get out of the woods, how to get back onto a street. And so they might not have traveled too far from where they were left, thinking that they were just getting farther into the woods, not wanting to, you know, make it worse for themselves. So when I picture it, I kind of think like they're just probably circling the same area, not wanting to get more lost. But again, we don't actually know. So some reports say that a group of friends that was out looking for Colt that night, when they get back into town, they see Khan, you know, just walking around town. He doesn't have his car and he doesn't have any answers for where Colt and Molly are. He's still not talking and he's still denying that he was even with them that night. So a whole day goes by and there's no more contact from Molly or Colt. And like I said, their cell phones were dead by 10 a.m. on the 8th. And on July 9th is when Molly's mom tries to file a missing persons report to Sheriff Joe Russell. And so he's the Love County Sheriff. And he allegedly, when they call him to file this report, he will not take it. He says it's not his problem. And, you know, right away, obviously, the family has a bad feeling about the situation. They feel like there's some sort of cover up happening. But Molly's mother is able to file a report with someone else, though, and that person takes down all the information and takes it upon herself to make missing persons posters for Molly. And Molly's cousin tells Up and Vanish that she speculates that it's because this person that had taken this report, because she was so outspoken about Molly and Colt's disappearance, like she seemed like she really cared and she wasn't going to give up on it, that that was the reason that she was fired from the sheriff's office just two months after Molly and Colt disappeared. So that's kind of just like an aside, some background information of what was happening when this case was fresh. I find it really odd that when Khan was driving erratically, that the guy just said to stop chasing him and not keep on going and like arrest him for speeding. Like I find that super odd and they just did nothing about it. Like now he's just walking around whatever and denying everything i just i I don't understand why they just didn't keep chasing him and arrest him for speeding yeah so you'll understand probably why when i get a little bit farther into this but the sheriff had also said that he didn't want to wreck one of his police cars just by chasing this guy because i guess it was a common thing and so they just kind of cut it short before he made any real damage it's very intriguing. I don't know what to think. I'm very, like I said, I had Blair Witch vibes. I don't know, obviously, where this is going or what how it ends up. But just the whole setting of them being lost in the woods at night is terrifying to me. I know. Just picture it. I mean, luckily, it was July. And, and I'm not sure if Oklahoma even gets cold ever. But he had a broken ankle. They were hiding in a creek bed, so they were likely wet. And I don't know, it just seems like a super scary, bad situation to be in. Just imagine being lost for that long in the woods at night. Like, And it's also kind of sad to say, you said that they kind of summarize or they, they think that they weren't actually that far away from where they either had started out or from where Khan left his car. So it's, it's not like they were so deep into the woods. 
it's like they there's the possibility that they could have been close to where they wanted to end up but you know you just get so disoriented in that setting like it all looks the same you don't know where you've been yeah exactly and like i was saying they might have been thinking the cops were still going to chase them so they could have even gotten out of the car and then started running again in the opposite direction so it wasn't like they could just go back to where they were because they were probably running trying to get away from the cops or something so that yeah they definitely got disoriented very quickly and either just could not find their way out or like i said before you know they kind of say like when you're lost in the woods the best thing to do is just stay where you are so it's people are looking for you is you're not like missing each other the whole time so that could have been what was happening but yeah it, it really is a mystery we really don't know what went down in the woods that night can you say again where that man was where he said, oh, I'm going to fire my gun and if they can hear it, we'll know that we're close. Do we know? Was that really far? Like that must have obviously been super, super far from where they went missing if they couldn't hear the gunshot, right? Like, did he travel? Like, did Khan go that far? It seems like I thought he was like some relatively close to where they would be able to hear the gunshot. So, I mean, if you look at a map of where this is kind of long hollow road is just i picture like this like this dark dirt road going off into the woods where a dead end he went all the way down that road they might not have even known the name of that road because they weren't familiar with the area like i said but he did know like oswald road which would have been like the main road that long hollow road branched off of but even if long hollow road was like a couple or a few kilometers long and they were on oswald road I mean, from the end of Long Hollow Road to where they were, could have been a few kilometers in between. So I don't know how far, like how long a distance you can hear a gunshot. But to me, that seems like a pretty far distance, a couple kilometers. Again, I don't know the exact distance, but they didn't know where they were exactly either. So they were just likely just not in the right spot. And even listening to Up and Vanish and some other podcasts and reading articles, they suggest that it's likely or suspected that drugs were involved as well like they could have been doing drugs that night so that probably didn't help the situation probably didn't help their bearings thinking straight so it just probably just made the situation worse right that was gonna be my next question like do they think drugs were involved because maybe they were disoriented already but with drugs involved they got more disoriented and were like high on drugs and they didn't know their surroundings and just makes the whole situation even worse when you're trying to find your way out yeah, and I also think about why she would call 911 but then not say anything and then not answer her phone when they called back, but then she continues to call other people, so it's not like she lost her phone. So, like, that doesn't make sense to me. Maybe it was a pocket dial. I mean, it's not likely that you pocket dial 911, but it's just the whole thing sounds strange. I'm just thinking, yeah, that is strange, but I'm thinking, do you think... That may be, this is just me thinking out loud, but something about cult being responsible. Like maybe, maybe Molly was trying to call 911 discreetly so she couldn't say anything on the phone, but she just called so that it would connect and that they could hear something. Like, you know what I mean? If she was felt threatened by cult and she just wanted to be discreet about it, maybe that would be why she would call but then not say anything like you know but who knows because you said they didn't really know each other right for that long before this according to molly's cousin she thinks that they had only known each other for maybe just like a week like they had just met and had become friends so it really wasn't they didn't know each other very well at all okay because yeah that's what i was just thinking of like you know you see in movies or stuff where somebody's like under duress or something and they managed to call 911 but then just like keep it connected so that the people can hear what's happening on the other side so that was just the first thing that came to mind like maybe she was trying to reach out to 911 because she was afraid of Colt like he was going to do something or something I don't know could be totally way off but that was just my first initial thought maybe or she could be afraid of Khan like, we don't know even though she had known Khan for a lot longer so they were kind of closer friends but I don't know, it kind of makes me think, like, that whole car chase, maybe... It makes me think, like, maybe they were doing something illegal, like, doing drugs in the car, and because Khan always gets away with this kind of thing, he's like, oh, let's make this interesting, and the cops will chase us, but we have drugs in the car, so if they catch us, it'll be even worse, so it's kind of like this adrenaline thing for him, and, you know, 
Colt and Molly are like, holy frig, like, we don't want to be a part of this. And so that could have been that thing where she wanted to call the police, but she was also afraid because they were doing drugs. They had drugs on them. So she's probably very conflicted. And it, yeah, the whole situation is just very weird. It's not like they, not like she ran away from Colt because they were together for, for as far as we know, for most of that time that they were out there. Yeah. Okay. So it's probably not what I was saying. Like it's, I'm probably super far off, but I don't know. It's just kind of weird. Why would you would call some 911 and then just not say anything? Cause that's right. She didn't say anything. Like there was nothing really happening. And like you said, it could have been a pocket dial, but at least one report was saying that the 911 operators could just hear like phone buttons being pushed on the other end. So it was almost like, she dialed 911 by mistake and was like still typing numbers or something or texting or maybe she texted 911 by mistake and it just called them. So that could be an answer to that. But then she does. So she doesn't want to answer them when they call back because she didn't mean to even call them. Another thing, they were scrutinizing like Oklahoma or the area's police department because there's a law like a domestic violence prevention where if someone calls 911 but they don't actually talk because maybe they're too scared to talk or there's somebody with them that they don't want to hear and they just hang up. The police are supposed to go out and actually find those people to make sure they're okay. And they're saying that that didn't happen in this case, either because A, they just didn't know where they were, or maybe someone did try and find them, but they had, they're had they out in the woods, so they're not going to go out in the woods to find them. So that kind of thing, people are saying if they would have just followed up, they would have found them, but it's probably not that simple. Okay, so... Can you guys guess who is related to James Con Nip in this story? Sheriff Russell? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so Sheriff Joe Russell is actually cousins with Con Nip. And it's reported that there's actually an understanding between the locals and Love County that if you go against one of them, then bad things will happen to you kind of thing. So they're kind of like this crime family. <laughs> um, surprise, surprise. Dun, dun, dun. Greetings, we're Technically a Conversation, a podcast for curious people by curious people. Every week, we take turns presenting a new topic, and the other host has no idea what the topic will be. We strive to educate in a way that's loose and fun. Our topics are all over the place, from light and funny to dark and sometimes spooky. Some of the topics we've covered include urban legends, civil rights activists, vampires, pop culture icons, the supernatural and occult, spies and espionage, science and astronomy, and other weird and random things. If any of these topics interest you, give our podcast a shot. Listen and subscribe at technicallyaconversation.com, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcast. Parental advisory, we might use strong language. You love history, science fiction, and role-playing. What if there was a podcast that brought all these things you love together in a deep, dramatic experience you'll never forget? Enter the Twilight Histories, a campaign-style storytelling podcast that casts you as the hero. With the Twilight Histories, you will travel to exotic worlds spread across the multiverse. Some are familiar, others are totally exotic. You'll visit Egypt locked in an ice age. You'll follow the Mongols across the American plains. You'll explore a terraformed Venus. Pick your adventure and experience a world out of time. The Twilight Histories was awarded one of Apple's Best of the Year and has been nominated for numerous awards in speculative fiction. Now, step on the platform and let's get you on your way. Let the Twilight Histories podcast carry you to a different world. When you know that detail, it makes more sense why the sheriff would call off the deputy chasing after Khan because it's his cousin. And it's like, well, it's not going to matter. He's not going to get in trouble anyway. So just don't bust up the car for no reason. So Joe Russell says because he was getting accused of trying to cover something up in this case that he just stayed out of it altogether. Like I remember I said, he said it wasn't his problem. And he just said that if he ever got a tip or anything, then he would just pass it along to someone else. But he kind of wiped his hands of it. To me, it kind of feels like maybe the right thing to do because it is a conflict of interest, especially if the accused, people are thinking Khan has something to do with this, obviously. He's related to Khan, so it's kind of a conflict of interest. That's his relative. 
but we don't know if he's like stepping away for good intentions or bad intentions. He probably just doesn't care enough to get involved. So once the Molly and Colt case is underway, the FBI gets involved to help with the search. And Molly is actually part Native American. And so under the McCurt ruling in Oklahoma, the FBI kind of get involved due to that circumstance. And it takes authorities two weeks to find Khan's abandoned car out in that wooded area. Even though it wasn't too far away from where he lived, either they weren't searching very hard or they just really didn't know where to look. But there is no sign of Colt or Molly at all. And this at least gives their families a little bit of an idea of where to even start their own searches. And some of Molly's family members do go down to Long Hollow Road and start searching on July 18th. But they are still unable to find any trace of Colt or Molly. So a couple of months go by and Molly's cousin... Paula. So she is the same cousin that was interviewed by Up and Banished, and she's kind of the spokesperson for this case. Her and Molly were pretty close. Even though Paula's a little bit older than Molly, Molly had been kind of sent to live with Paula just because of some things that were going on with her. Her parents sent her out to live with her cousin Paula, but they were really close. And so, you know, Paula is the one that's kind of leading this search for Molly. So Paula comes face to face with Khan in September of 2013 and she asks him where Molly and Colt are. She tells Up and Vanished, she says, quote, I asked Khan if Molly and Colt were okay when he left them in the woods and he said, I don't know what you're talking about. I never was with Molly and Colt. I didn't leave them in the woods, end quote. And she also goes on to say, quote, I finally said, Khan, I know she's dead. End quote. She says that Khan did kind of cheer up at this moment. And she says, quote, I said, please just tell us where she's at. End quote. So like I said, she says that Khan did cheer up a little bit. So she thinks that he does have a little bit of remorse for whatever happened in the woods that night. So whether he just left them there for something else to happen or whether he knows exactly what did happen to them if he did something or if he knows somebody else that might have done something to them a few more months go by and there's nothing new that arises in the case until eight months after molly and colt have disappeared in march of 2014 there is another strange 911 call that comes in from a man named colby barrick's phone and colby barrick is con's uncle so he's related to the sheriff in some way as well And so, yeah, like I said, this is a strange 911 call because it seems to be a pocket dial and it's really muffled and it's hard to hear. Of course it is, because nothing can ever be clear. I know, but who pocket dials 911? Like, is this another pocket dial to 911? Like, how have you guys ever pocket dialed 911? That's never happened to me. No. No, never. And like twice in this case? I don't think you can. I feel like you, 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 I mean, I'm sure you can. But it's just, what are the odds that those are going to be the three Mm -hmm. digits that you hit? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. So, yeah, it's strange. And so, yeah, like I said, it was muffled. But they think they can hear the speaker mention Molly and Colt's alleged murder. So, Oxygen.com reports that what is said in the 911 call goes something like this. Quote, You know you're fucking mad. You know you're fucking tired. Fucking Moxley Lake. A buck knife. Molly Miller, they shot him in the mouth. Right there, I can put my finger all the way through it. End quote. So, obviously this is choppy, but these are just the things that they're able to make out, that 911 dispatcher. And so, the person that does listen to this call, she calls Joe Russell right away to let him know about the call and the conversation, but she doesn't mention the Moxley Lake part of the conversation, but somehow Joe already knows about Moxley Lake, even though he wasn't told. And that call is actually later traced to an area around Moxley Lake, which is just off of Long Hollow Road. But of course, that area is never searched by authorities. What is this? Like, why aren't they like- I'm scared. I literally got like goosebumps when you were reading like that. that. That's so creepy. It's so creepy. That is creepy. I know. And when like, what a coincidence that someone that's involved in the murder or knows what happened is out at the murder site making a 911 call accidentally and they're able to trace that call back 
there? Like, how, wh- how does that happen? <laughs> but how do they know that that's for sure what they said? Like, did they have, like, professional audio people come in and, like, figure out what was being said? Because it was muffled, so I feel like... Yeah, I mean, they must have, because they did play it on the Up and Vanished podcast. But yeah, so if you listen to that, you can't hear shit. Like, it really is super muffled as if it was in a pocket. So I don't... They were able to... Ext- obviously, a professional probably able to extract that. Or it could have been the 911 operator that took the call because it would have been clearer for her, maybe. So she was like, yeah, this is what they said. So I don't know. There's no way that Molly Miller would be alive. Like, she's not making the 911 calls, is she? No, but it wasn't her. It was just some random person. Oh. No, it was it was coming from Colby Barrick's phone, which is Khan's uncle, out at Moxley Lake, which is just off Long Hollow Road. Like, who are these people? Crime family. <laughs> <laughs> no, but he was the one. So he was the one who called. And it was him speaking in the muffled voice. Like, what, what was the... I mean, I guess you said you you couldn't hear shit, so you don't know. But, like, did it sound like a male voice? Was it a female voice? Like, it was him, right? We know. Yeah, I mean, I there's no way for me to be like, yeah, it was Colby Barrick. That's just the information I'm getting. That it was from his phone. It doesn't mean it was f- from him, though. No, it doesn't mean it was from him. But it was people that knew, seemingly knew about what happened to Molly and Colt. <laughs> Mm, And I mean, and Colby Barrick's Khan's uncle. So it kind of seems like all fits together. But we don't know for sure. Did Khan kill them for like drug money or something? This is where my head's going. But you could go down so many rabbit holes thinking what happened. It is very eerie. Like maybe it was like a drug fueled kind of chase thing and then something happened. But we know that Khan made it home while Molly and Colt were still out in those woods. So you think like why if he was friends with molly why not you know go back try to find her bring them back to his house maybe he just didn't care maybe he like i said he was on drugs so he wasn't thinking straight was he thinking it could have been like a sick practical joke like he was gonna i'm gonna drive them out here and i'm gonna abandon them and it'll be funny that could be something too and then maybe when he realized that something bad has happened to them, then he felt like oh well i have to now kind of cover it up because it's gonna make it seem like i'm one like if i said oh i was doing a practical joke like maybe it would make people be suspicious of him so maybe he tried to like cover it up in certain ways i don't know yeah and because like i was saying there's a little bit of bad blood it seems between con and colt because one of them is dating the other one's ex-girlfriend so they're obviously not happy about that but why are they hanging out in the first place but i was also thinking that maybe there's this like love triangle thing going on between these these three people it could have been like maybe Molly was with Colt and he was pissed and who knows. Yeah, so there was kind of speculation that people were thinking that Molly was kind of infatuated with Colt. Like she had this kind of crush even though she didn't know him for very long. And we don't know what Colt's feelings really were. So it could have been this whole thing and maybe Khan was jealous of that. So yeah, like I said, it just brings up more mysteries and questions than we actually get answers to. So Khan was eventually charged with something related to what happened that night so in 2014 he was charged with endangering others while eluding the police assault with a dangerous weapon and unauthorized use of a vehicle and he only served four years out of a 10-year sentence but that's all he's ever been charged with so nothing that's related to molly and colt's disappearance at all so When the FBI were doing their investigation, they also started looking into Sheriff Joe Russell because, you know, he's sketchy and the family were thinking that something was going on there because he showed little interest in investigating this case. And so as a result of that FBI investigation, Joe Russell is actually indicted with corruption in office charges and habitual or willful neglect of duty. So he had two counts each for both of those. So surprise, surprise, here's a corrupt sheriff. And as a result, he's actually eventually arrested on criminal charges in 2016 because he allegedly let his son, who is a convicted drug dealer, deal meth out of their house. And he also allowed his son to use the police vehicles to go out on drug runs and deal meth with the police cars. And it's alleged as well that Khan could have been a part of this drug dealing in some way as well. So it was kind of this whole family enterprise drug thing happening. And yeah, so at least the sheriff is held accountable for his actions in some way. So allegations are also out there that the sheriff would like take 
girls in bikinis back to his house and he would give them drugs if they would strip for him. So just like a sleazy, crooked cop. He actually resigned in 2016 amid all of this. And he accepted a plea deal in 2017, so he was actually only sentenced to probation and house arrest as a result, as reported by Up and Vanished. Really? (laughs) Yeah. This case just gets worse. I know. Are there any legit cops anymore? I genuinely question that. Like, it seems like every case we ever have ever done comes down to follow the police department. You'll get your answers. Yeah, it is kind of shocking how many times we come up with that conclusion that it was something that the police were trying to cover up. It's usually some crooked cop in there somewhere. Yeah, and so he was the sheriff of this like small little community and just kind of running the town the way he wanted. No consequences for him or his family. Like I said, Khan never had to really face any consequences because his uncle was the fucking sheriff. So, and then it wasn't until he finally resigned that Khan did actually get some jail time. There were no murder charges, like no kidnapping or anything like that. It just had to do with evading police. So also in 2018, Colby Barrick, so he's Khan's uncle, the guy who pocket dialed 911, he gets arrested for gun possession. And while in jail, he comes forward with a tip that Molly and Colt's bodies are actually in Moxley Lake. And so Moxley Lake is where Molly's family feels that Colt and Molly's bodies actually are. And there's speculation that the bodies were moved from the Nips family property into Moxley Lake. And I'm thinking because that 911 call that day pinged in Moxley Lake, it's almost like, what if they were moving the bodies that day into Moxley Lake and they happened to dial 911? Like, wouldn't that just be a coincidence? And it seems like it's almost like a gift from... The high heavens, like they caught them literally red-handed in the act. Yeah, like well, what what shit luck they would have to have for it's like the moment that they're they're hiding the bodies for them to accidentally dial nine one one. Yeah, they're talking about it, and moving the bodies, and meanwhile nine one one is listening. But I mean, uh, yeah, it's kind of crazy how that happened. But yeah, so that like I said, that nine one one call that pocket dial had come in eight months after the disappearances, so they're thinking maybe they did move the bodies eight months later. Still though, Moxley Lake has never been searched by authorities, and of course the Nip family refuses to have anyone on their property to search their property as well. So in January of twenty twenty one, Molly was declared legally dead, even though her body has never been recovered. And it was reported by Mike Rogers for K-12 News that the FBI actually opened up their own investigation. So they were involved in the investigation, but it wasn't their own investigation. They were just helping. And so they opened up actually their own investigation in May of 2021 because of an informant that had come forward with compelling information. And this was allegedly due to Molly's cousin, Paula, convincing that person to go to the FBI with their information. So like I said, Paul is right in there telling this informant, like, talk to the FBI. And they actually do. So just in November of 2021, a search warrant was pending in Love County due to a probable cause affidavit that had been submitted by authorities. And that PI that I was talking about before, Philip Klein, he tells K-12 News that all the evidence for this search warrant was pooled together a couple of years ago by all of the investigators and law enforcement agencies that had been involved. And so I guess that's a good example of all the groups kind of coming together, teamwork to get all their evidence in one place to get this search warrant. And so this search warrant was actually for an area that was close to Long Hollow Road. It's about a half a kilometer from where they had already done a search and a dig two to three years ago, but they just didn't get far enough to this particular location. Unfortunately, though, that search warrant has been denied by a judge November 30th of 2021. So, like many missing persons cases, the answer to this whole thing is just on the tip of someone's tongue, probably on the tip of Khan's tongue, and he won't talk. What makes this case a little bit different is that we know who knows what happened, because a lot of the time it's the person that did it or that knows something is unknown to police. But in this case, we actually know who knows. We still don't have any answers and there's still not justice. So that's all we have on this case. It's very mysterious. It's very kind of like, what the hell? Of course, police corruption, all in there. Yeah, that's really creepy. The whole time you were describing, 
everything with them being in the woods and stuff like it just gave me the heebie jeebies it's just that's like my worst nightmare i feel is being lost in the woods at nighttime the up and vanish podcast that's the same one that did the tara grinstead case right that we did when we did that last season yeah it's actually a coincidence i'm not just listening to up and vanish and stealing other cases <laughs> <laughs> when we got that tip from the listener i looked into it and it happened that they did one episode on it so that was um, a good source of information but yeah so it is a little bit similar to the like, Tara Grinstead case, just in terms of it, you know, being a small town and all these people who might know each other and all these, you know, this dark sort of twists and turns and all the questions that still exist, right? So I, as you were reading that, I thought a lot about the Tara Grinstead case, just like the overall tone of it is similar. And so it's just interesting that it's the Up and Vanished podcast also covered it. Yeah, it definitely is. It doesn't seem as convoluted as the Tara Grinstead one. But it does have the same kind of vibe where someone just goes missing. And it seems like there's even less evidence in this case because it's like there's no trace of them anywhere. Yeah, this one has like much fewer layers, but I feel it's still similar in terms of, you know, this person knows this person who might know this person who might know this information, you know, so. Is that why the search word was denied because there's not enough information to search that area? I don't exactly know why it was denied. There's not much out there about that. All we know is that it was denied for some reason. The Love County Police Department is is saying that the case is still open and they are still actively investigating, but I don't know if they can say it's gone cold because I feel like we know who knows, but they're just not talking. They know who knows, but we don't know who knows, right? Well, I feel like Khan knows what happened. Yeah. He's definitely not saying everything right he's saying he wasn't even with molly and colt that night and from everything that i can find is that they know that he was for sure but it's never been officially confirmed that he is that he is the one who knows something right it's just like we i just assume that he does which i guess how could he not if he was with them there that with if he was with them that night in some way i feel like he definitely knows more than he's saying Mm -hmm. It's all speculation that he knows something because we're going to put the pieces together. He was the last one to see them out there and he left them out in the woods. So, I mean, yeah, even if he doesn't know exactly what happened to them, at the very least, he knows more than he said, which then questions, well, why is he withholding certain information? I'm curious to know, like, if Khan and the uh, Sheriff Russell and the other guy that dialed number one, what was his name? Colby. Yes, I feel like they're all three of them are involved in this disappearance of these two kids because they're like all like a drug family. They all are in drugs together. Allegedly, allegedly, yes. But I feel like I don't know. I, that's just my theory. I think they were all involved somehow, and maybe they are in that lake out there. Yeah, and it seems like even if the sheriff wasn't involved directly, he's either knows more than he's saying or he's covering it up or you know he didn't want to look into it so he wasn't helping either so i mean even though it's still so much a mystery i feel in some ways it's it's mysterious but also it seems fairly in my mind anyway it seems fairly straightforward i i feel like definitely those three major people like con and the uh joseph and the colby like i feel there's definitely something there even though we don't know the exact details of what, but I feel like it seems pretty obvious just based on these details that something to do with the three of them or I don't know. Allegedly, of course, because I don't know anything. But Yeah, and also what came up in Up and Vanish, like we were even talking about before, that small town vibe kind of thing. It's not hard to believe that people in the town would know more than they're saying. And Up and Vanish was saying that people are scared to come forward, not because they think that something's going to physically happen to them. They're not thinking someone's going to kill them if they come forward, but they're thinking that because they're never planning on leaving that town. And so if they have information about the people that are involved or, you know, the police department, then it's kind of going to ruin their life in that town. So they don't want that to happen. So they're just going to leave it as is to protect kind of, you know, their livelihood in that town so that's kind of unfortunate yeah i feel every time we do cases where it's you know a small town i always think of you know where people are hesitant to come forward or you know the assumption that everyone knows more than what they're saying and i think 
I think a part of that is true. I feel like when you think of our like our small town, if somebody were to if there was like a big mystery and somebody were to go missing, I feel you just know kind of or most people know sort of like the small town gossip. So people might draw their own conclusion. So it's like people might think that they know more than they know, but they really don't. It's just based on sort of gossip around the town. And I feel like that happens with any small town. And people are hesitant to come forward because everyone does know each other. So it's a lot more risk going forward if you do know something just because, you know, if that gets around the town, you know what I mean? So I feel like every time we cover a small town case, I always think of try to understand it from their perspective of the people in the town and why they might not come forward with certain things just because I feel like, you know, being from a small town that kind of relate to that feeling of everyone would know, you know what I mean? Yeah, definitely. And people probably think, like you said, they probably think they know more than they actually do. Like in a small town, people know stuff about you that you don't even know about yourself, right? Because people are just making stuff up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and people love to speculate too. Like, you know, if somebody were to go missing from a small town, people will use a story that happened 20 years ago from that person's life and then somehow draw it to like what happened in the current day or something. Or, you know what I mean? So people love to sort of feel like they might know. And people love to speculate and theorize. So I think that's just inevitable, especially in a small town. Yeah, it definitely is. But if you're listening and you actually do think you know something about this case, you can contact the Love County tip line on their website at lovecosheriff.com. And you can also call and speak to the sheriff directly or the undersheriff. This is a new sheriff, remember? It's not Joe Russell. You can call them at 580-276-3150, extension 2. Or you can contact the Oklahoma Bureau of Investigations as they are the primary investigating agency for this case. And their number is 405-848-6724. Crazy. That's a, that was a interesting case. I knew nothing really about it before you went into it. So mm-hmm. it's very mysterious. I found it really eerie. Like it was just like AJ had goosebumps. It was so creepy. Yeah, I just feel like the... It was so vivid the way you were describing the them being lost in the woods and like the 911 calls and all that stuff. It's like I could like see it in my mind playing out as you were saying it. And it was really creepy. It kind of felt like something you would see in like a horror movie. So definitely creepy. Yeah, like even researching that and then just picturing it in your mind, it is very, you can almost feel like it happening to you and just how distressful it would have been in that situation for sure. So Everyone speculates that they're probably dead. I mean, Molly's legally declared dead. So their last few hours were probably just really scared and they were frantic and, you know, lost in the woods. So it's a really tragic end for these really young people that really had their whole life ahead of them. You want to hope that they're alive, but at this point, it's highly unlikely that they are. Yeah. Where could they be if they were and why haven't they reached out to anyone yet is, you know, the first thing you think of. I feel there's probably next to no chance that they're alive, unfortunately. I mean, I would be shocked if they were. You know, I think all signs point to the fact that they died that night or very shortly after. So, But it's very strange that that was the last area that they know they were because the cell phones were pinging there. They were calling people saying they were off Oswald Road and things. But they still haven't been able to find more evidence. Like, they haven't searched that lake where they've gotten, like, multiple kind of hits and why haven't they searched that lake yet? Why haven't they searched that area where the search warrant is? It just seems like if they're out there, and if they are, their bodies are dead out there somewhere, like, why haven't they found them yet? It just seems like, what's all the red tape about? Yeah, and there's so many cases out there that literally have nothing to go on, no leads, who you would kill to have that information, you know, an exact pinpointed from a cell phone as to where they were last were. So that's like golden information that you would love to have. And the fact that they have that in this case, and they're not doing more with it, and they're not looking into it more, it's really sad. Yeah, and literally them telling their friends, or at least Colt saying, "I'm this is where I am, I'm off this road, like, come find me, that kind of thing. And that doesn't happen all the time either. I usually have no idea where their last whereabouts were in a lot of cases. Yeah, it seems like it should be case closed, you know? They have an exact location. I know, but it's still a cold case, so it's really, really crazy. Okay, so that's it for the case today. Thanks for joining us. You can follow us on all the social medias, on Facebook at Crime Family Podcast, Instagram at Crime Family Podcast, on Twitter at Crime Family Pod 1, and you can email us with tips 
tips or case suggestions at crimefamilypodcast at gmail.com. Thanks. See you next time. Bye. Bye.